Aumuamua wasn't just a weird rock flying through space. It was the first alien object we caught passing through our solar system. Then came Comet Borisov, two interstellar visitors in just two years. If that sounds rare, scientists now suggest it might actually be common. In fact, new research points to Alpha Centauri as a source of material already drifting into our neighborhood and even entering our atmosphere. But how can scientists tell if a pebble in Earth's sky one once came from another star system? That's where this story gets fascinating. Have you ever wondered how any piece of rock, comet, or dust grain actually gets thrown out of a star system? After all, planets and asteroids are held in place by the enormous pull of gravity. It might seem impossible for something to just slip away, but the trick lies in a cosmic game of catch and throw. When a smaller body gets too close to a massive planet like Jupiter, the planet's gravity can act like a slingshot. In Instead of pulling the rock inward, the planet can fling it outward at such a speed that it's no longer bound to the star at all. With the right trajectory, that object doesn't just escape the planet, it leaves the entire solar system behind. Think of it like joining a ride on a speeding carousel. Get caught near the biggest horse, and the kick you receive can toss you out of the circle for good. Here's why that matters. If big planets in our solar system can throw space debris into the void, then other stars with their own giant planets must be doing the same thing. Every star in the galaxy has the potential to act as a kind of launcher, accidentally catapulting fragments of rock and ice into interstellar space. That raises a natural question. If we eject material, how much comes back the other way? Could our skies already be filled with pieces from other systems that we haven't even recognized? A clear way to think about this is a playground full of kids and balls. Picture the playground as a star system, the kids as planets, and the fence as the star's gravitational edge. With so many kids kicking balls around, some are bound to bounce over the fence into the neighbor's yard. In space, the balls don't just stop, they keep rolling endlessly. And just like that neighbor's yard, our solar system is wide open to receive objects kicked out from across the galaxy. Computer simulations give us an idea of how common this really is. They suggest that billions of individual rocks and ice fragments are set free from their home systems every year. Once launched, they don't have a destination. They drift, not in neat orbits like planets, but as wanderers carried loosely by the pull of the galaxy as a whole. Over millions of years, some of these loners inevitably pass close to other stars, occasionally slipping inside and joining a new community of objects. It's not a rare event. It's a kind of exchange program that never stops. Now, think about our own backyard, the Oort Cloud. This vast halo of icy bodies surrounds the solar system at incredible distances, stretching nearly halfway to the nearest stars. Astronomers usually describe it as a leftover storage zone for early solar material. But there's a twist. Studies suggest the Oort Cloud may not be entirely ours. It could also hold visitors, foreign comets and asteroids that drifted in ages ago and now orbit quietly at the extreme edges, indistinguishable at a glance from native ones. In fact, some models predict that as many as a million large objects, each more than 100 meters wide, currently residing in the Oort cloud, may have started their journey in Alpha Centauri. That means our nearest stellar neighbors might already have left a cosmic calling card in the outskirts of our own system. The challenge, of course, is that a stray rock doesn't come labeled with a return address, telling the difference between a body born in our system, and one born around another star is incredibly difficult. Scientists ask, what signatures would prove that a comet or meteor carried an alien past? Is it in the isotopes of the elements, the ratios of gases trapped inside, or tiny differences in orbits that hint at foreign origins? The problem remains unsolved, but the question itself shows just how porous the borders between star systems may be. So the picture shifts. Instead of each star living in complete isolation, Stars seem to constantly trade scraps of matter. Far from being rare accidents, these exchanges may be an essential part of how galaxies recycle and share their raw material. But sending fragments across interstellar distances is only half the story. The next step is asking which of these survivors actually make it through the brutal physical obstacles of such a long journey. What kind of rock can actually survive a journey across 26 trillion miles of 
space. The vast distance between Alpha Centauri and our solar system isn't the only challenge. The journey itself is filled with hazards that grind away at anything drifting through the interstellar medium. Think about it. Space may look empty, but it's more like a giant sand blaster stretched over light years, where even tiny dust particles and streams of energy slowly chip away at anything moving through. Magnetic fields thread through the galaxy and twist the paths of small, charged grains, scattering them and sometimes trapping them entirely. Then there's radiation, especially high-energy cosmic rays, which can steadily erode the surface of exposed particles. Over millions of years, those impacts can strip material atom by atom, reducing fragile grains to nothing. Add in collisions with microscopic dust specks, traveling at astonishing speeds, and any small visitor faces constant bombardment, and even the thin soup of interstellar gas matters at these scales. Molecules bump against a moving particle, creating drag that's enough to slow or scatter weaker fragments. So what makes it through? The smallest bits certainly don't. Grains smaller than a micron, thinner than the finest smoke particle, are practically doomed. They're shredded, deflected, or vaporized long before they can cover interstellar distances. That leaves us with an important question. If fragile dust is destroyed so easily, how could anything large enough ever cross four light years and still show up in Earth's atmosphere? The answer has to do with size. Simulations show that once you pass a certain threshold, resilience jumps dramatically. Objects larger than about 10 microns, which is only one-tenth the width of a human hair, are tough enough to endure the radiation, gas drag, and dust collisions long enough to cross the gap. They still lose material along the way, but they don't disappear. Imagine the contrast. A dust moat floating in a sunbeam would vanish during the trek, yet a tiny grain as wide as a single hair could actually make the leap from one star system to another intact. That's not speculation alone. Models predict that such survival is not only possible, but happening constantly. Every year, Earth intercepts a trickle of these alien travelers. Around 10 particles originally ejected from Alpha Centauri likely penetrate our atmosphere annually. When one of these grains rams into the air at cosmic speeds, it produces a brief flash of light, small but detectable as a meteor. In effect, we already get a visible sign of material born under another sun streaking through our night skies. Think about the time scales involved. Some of the material striking our upper atmosphere tonight could have left Alpha Centauri tens of millions of years ago. That means a single speck glowing for an instant above us might have begun its journey back when giant dinosaurs were still roaming Earth. The history woven into such a grain is staggering. Surviving stars exploding, passing through different regions of the galaxy, only to finally meet Earth after an unimaginably long odyssey. And this isn't fixed forever. The movement of stars slowly changes the closeness of our nearest neighbors. In about 28,000 years, Alpha Centauri will actually drift much closer than it is today. Researchers expect that when that happens, the number of particles making the crossing could rise dramatically, maybe 10 times higher than the current trickle. Future skies may see an increased rain of Alpha Centauri grains, silently burning up and leaving nothing but a faint trace of light in the dark. So the quiet truth is that every year, fragments from another solar system fall on our planet. They're tiny, often no larger than motes of dust, but they're real links to another star's story. They tell us that star systems aren't sealed off. They already share their material across the void. And if nature does this accidentally, we can't help but imagine what might happen if we chose to send something across on purpose. Not just a grain of dust, but a mission carried with intention. If tiny grains of rock from Alpha Centauri can drift across space and fall into our atmosphere, it's natural to wonder, could we send something back? Instead of waiting for accidental visitors, what if we built a probe and gave it the push it needs to make the crossing on purpose? Right away, we run into a huge problem. At the speeds of today's rockets, even the fastest ones we've ever launched, a spacecraft would need tens of thousands of years to travel the four light years to our nearest neighbors. That's longer than the entire span of human civilization. Clearly, if we want to make interstellar travel real within our own lifetimes, we need to think in very different terms. People have suggested bold ideas before. One of the most famous is the concept of using giant lasers to push tiny light sails to incredible speeds. In those planets, 
plans. A paper-thin sheet captures the pressure of a powerful laser beam shot across space, letting a craft accelerate without carrying fuel. It could potentially reach a significant fraction of the speed of light, but there's a major trade-off. Thin sails are delicate by design. They can only support very small payloads, sometimes no more than a microchip. That means only the most minimal sensors can be carried. If we wanted to send something heavier, cameras, instruments, maybe even equipment for slowing down on arrival, the sail idea faces serious limits. This is where a provocative concept called the Sunbeam Mission enters the conversation. Instead of strapping fuel tanks onto a probe or relying entirely on fragile sails, it suggests using an outside power source. The plan involves placing a satellite close to the sun, where sunlight is most intense. This satellite would act like a power plant, turning the sun's energy into usable electricity. From there, it would generate a focused electron beam, a stream of high-speed charged particles, and direct it toward a spacecraft. As the electron beam hits, it transfers momentum, steadily pushing the craft faster and faster without it having to carry its own propellant. That's not as simple as it sounds. One reason electron beams aren't normally considered for long distances is that they spread out quickly. Charged particles naturally repel one another, and the beam fans out, losing energy. But there's an effect in physics known as the relativistic pinch. When electrons are moving extremely close to the speed of light, the beam creates its own magnetic field that holds it together more tightly. Instead of dispersing, the stream can stay narrow over large distances, making it possible to maintain a push on the spacecraft across a vast span of space. The energy requirements also sound extreme, but they're not completely out of reach. To accelerate a spacecraft this way would take power levels in the same ballpark as what large physics experiments already use. Think about the Large Hadron Collider, which smashes particles together in Europe. The Sunbeam system would need very high power, but not orders of magnitude beyond what we already handle in research facilities. That's important because it shifts the idea from pure science fiction into the realm of an engineering challenge. The payoff, if it worked, would be extraordinary. Calculations suggest a spacecraft accelerated by this method could reach speeds of about 10% the speed of light, or 0.1c. That doesn't sound like much until you realize it's nearly 29,000 kilometers per second. At that speed, Alpha Centauri comes within reach in roughly 40 years. Compare that to the tens of millennia required by chemical rockets. Suddenly, a human lifetime is enough to imagine a probe leaving Earth, crossing the interstellar gulf, and sending data back from a completely different star system. That transforms Alpha Centauri from an unreachable point of light into a destination. A mission launched within this century could plausibly be met with responses from the craft before its designer's grandchildren have grown old. It suggests that interstellar travel need not be resigned to the distant future, but something tangible. And if the Sunbeam mission stands as a bridge to that reality, the big question becomes which technologies today lay the groundwork for turning such a vision into a workable system? Can today's technology really give us the starting pieces for something as ambitious as an interstellar probe? The idea at first sounds too large, so far beyond what we've built before, that it almost feels untouchable. But step by step, you begin to notice pieces already in motion. Take the Parker Solar Probe. It's flying closer to the sun than any spacecraft before, enduring heat and radiation that would melt or fry ordinary electronics. Every pass it completes near the sun proves that materials and shields can be designed to survive in conditions that earlier missions could never handle. That's important because a sun-powered accelerator, like the Sunbeam concept, would require a satellite parked dangerously close to this furnace. Without Parker, it might feel like fantasy. With Parker, it feels like the first test case already works. Here on Earth, engineers wrestle with another challenge, keeping beams of light steady while they cross the atmosphere. Adaptive optics has changed what telescopes and lasers can do. By adjusting mirrors thousands of times per second, adaptive optics cancels out the flicker caused by air, letting beams stay sharp. The same techniques could help keep directed beams stable, whether they are guiding a laser sail or holding an electron beam focused for long ranges. We aren't starting from scratch. Observatories today already use these corrections.
functions nightly to deliver images of distant exoplanets. Autonomous space navigation is another cornerstone. A spacecraft traveling for four decades can't rely on controllers pressing buttons from Earth. By the time a signal arrives, many hours will have passed, so the craft needs to adjust its own course. Fortunately, deep space missions already practice a form of this. Probes like the Mars rovers and distant explorers such as New Horizons have software able to respond to new conditions without constant supervision. The level of decision-making they use today is crude, but each generation gets better. For an interstellar probe, scaling that autonomy to handle long-term course corrections and targeting adjustments becomes the next obvious step, not a leap into the unknown. The Sunbeam mission also proposes converting the sun's heat near perihelion into power using high-temperature thermoelectrics. At its simplest, a thermoelectric device takes a temperature difference and turns it into electricity. In our daily lives, they're used in camping coolers or in waste heat recovery systems. On a spacecraft, enormous amounts of near-solar heat could be collected and transformed into a reliable, continuous output. Technology hasn't yet pushed thermoelectrics to that extreme, but the physics is proven, and prototypes already operate at temperatures high enough to hint at feasibility when adapted for near-solar conditions. The probe itself must be designed for a strange reality, constant external thrust. Instead of coasting in silence, it would experience a steady push, almost like a surfer balancing endlessly on a moving wave. That requires a craft shaped to remain stable, despite continuous acceleration, with materials that don't fatigue after years of stress. Engineering has already taught us how to build things like ion-driven satellites that handle ongoing small pushes from plasma engines. Transferring that principle into a long-distance relativistic push is hard, but not distant from concepts flying now. Navigation again deserves a closer look. The spacecraft would need to orient itself precisely while moving a tenth the speed of light, adjusting course with micro-thrusters, real-time star tracking, and algorithms smart enough to reject errors. Trials of star-based navigation already happen, where spacecraft use cameras to map constellations and figure out their position without Earth's guidance. Those same methods, scaled and hardened, form the brain of a mission that must explore without possibility of mid-course correction from its makers. So when you add up these pieces, shielding close to the sun, beam focusing, autonomous course control, thermoelectric power conversion, and structural resilience, the daunting scale starts to shrink into specific steps. Each part doesn't require reinvention of physics. They grow out of technologies already demonstrated, stretched to new limits, but not beyond play. That's the revealing truth. Interstellar exploration might not demand warp drives or impossible engines. It asks for careful integration of what we are already building. And think of the symmetry here. Alpha Centauri may already be sprinkling fragments into our skies each year. Uninvited packages slipping into Earth's atmosphere. In the coming future, we might answer by sending back a probe, a deliberate messenger moving across the same frontier, which leads to one final thought. If matter flows both ways, what does that say about how connected star systems really are? We aren't as isolated as we might think. Pieces of Alpha Centauri already drift in our solar system, orbiting among comets that look no different from our own. A few even streak across Earth's skies each year, their journeys ending as meteors before anyone notices their true origin. The surprising part is how close we may be to sending something back. Technologies exist right now that could become the basics of interstellar flight. What if interstellar travel isn't centuries away, but simply the next stage of using tools we already hold? Stay curious, because the next visitor may reveal ourselves 